Good evening to all. I am Dr. Simran Chandwani, and I bid a very warm welcome to one and all the renowned speakers and delegates who took out their valuable time and joined us today to be a part of this conference. Welcome you to Pradhanya 2022, day two. We are honored to have you all with us. So we begin today's session of the conference with the topic, hospital management. Hospital management is the field relating to leadership, management, and administration of public health systems, healthcare systems, hospitals, and hospital networks in all the primary, secondary, and tertiary sectors. With all these words, I'm profoundly delighted to welcome and call upon our chair, Professor Rao, for today's session. Professor Rao is leading the International Research Collaboration at International Medical School, Management and Science University, Malaysia. Professor Rao research focuses on epidemiology, health promotion, public policy, research methodology, communicable and non-communicable diseases, environmental health, nutrition, aging and quality of life, social and behavioral health and healthcare management. We welcome you, sir. Now, I would like to introduce speakers for today's session. Dr. Vivek Desai. Dr. Vivek Desai is the founder of Hosmec India Private Limited. Dr. Vivek Desai was a special invitee for Confederation of Indian Industry, Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry, and the Indian Merchant Chambers, and worked as an advisor to the World Bank USAID Indian Ministry of Health. Dr. Desai will be discussing about engineering designing innovations for hospital buildings. Next, we have with us Mr. Chakraborty, is currently the Chief Operating Officer after holding the position of Senior Director Operations of Hinduja Hospital. Mr. Chakraborty is currently a member of the National Healthcare Committee, Accreditation Committee of NABH and Health Sector Skill Council. American Society for Quality and the Academy of Hospital Administrator. He is going to share his thoughts on the topic innovation in healthcare through technology. Next, we have Ms. Richa Singh Dev Gupta, a healthcare management professional with 23 years of experience associated with healthcare delivery brand in India. She is an alumni of IIHMR University, which makes us immensely proud. Ms. Richa has been with Fortis Healthcare for 12 years and currently holds the position of Chief of Strategy and Operations with the group. We welcome you, ma'am. She will be enlightening us with the topic technological enhancement in hospital management due to pandemic. Next, we have Dr. Sumana. She is a medical doctor in health and health hospital management professional with over 15 years of clinical and managerial experience. Dr. Sumana presently is a senior consultant in Niti Aayog, Government of India. Dr. Sumana volunteered her time with NGOs in the space, in the space of rural healthcare and interest in medical legal and health policy issues. She will be talking about innovations in hospital management digital health and all. Now, I would like to hand over the session to our chair, Professor Dr. Roy, to proceed further with the session. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Simran, and nice meeting to all the panelists in this session. Uh, may I take this opportunity to thank uh, my friend, Professor uh, Dr. P. R. Sudani, the president of IIHMR University. Thank you so much, sir, for the invitation and confidence. Uh, Dr. Sudani and I, and with the management and Science University Malaysia are in the process of uh, discussion for the possible university collaboration, not only on the student teacher exchange program, but looking for an avenue for research collaboration. And to the Pradanya 2022 Organizing Committee, uh, congratulations on a well-organized conference. Welcome to the second track of the Pradanya Conference, which is hospital management with a theme of healthcare and education, the decade of acceleration for global health. 
health is well placed on sustainable developmental goals three. And its main objective is to ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all of all ages. The SDG declaration emphasizes that to achieve the overall health goal, we must achieve first universal health coverage, second, access to quality healthcare, and lastly, to ensure that no one must be left behind. And definitely, hospitals play a vital role in the realization of this SDG number three. Hospital management is consistently under a huge amount of pressure to deliver quality care with limited resources. Factors such as an aging population, sharp rises in long-term conditions, reduced funding, increased patient expectations, and of course, uh, the current COVID-19 pandemic are the reasons that we must do some form of innovation to ensure a high quality of patient care. Innovation denotes new, better, more effective ways of solving problems. Within the context of healthcare, the World Health Organization states that innovation responds to unmet pub public health needs by creating a new ways of thinking and learning. And also it aims to add value in the form of improved efficiency, effectiveness, quality, sustainability, and affordability. In today's digital world, it is not surprising that the concept of hospital innovation is tightly interconnected with digital transformation and digitalization. And to remain competitive, both in the eyes of the patient and the potential staff. And many organizations have recognized that they need to adopt cutting edge digital healthcare technologies. And this could include platforms for virtual appointments, telemedicine, uh, novel surgical imaging technologies, wearable medical devices, mobile health apps, and many more. And the state of the art, digital technologies and procedures help enhance the reputation of hospital organizations, distinguishing them from their competitors. Not only will help in attracting and retaining clinical staff and patients, but through innovation, hospital organizations have the potential to improve patient care. Now let us move to the first topic of this session. Hospitals play an important role in the healthcare system, and hospital design definitely has been an evolving in high speed and gradually incorporating elements and concepts that respond to the needs of patients, the families, and healthcare personnel. Every hospital design process incorporates and integrates innovative features necessary to support and sustain the various hospital models. The hospital design of the present and the future strive to make patients and the medical staff as comfortable as possible without compromising the effectiveness of services. Therefore, it is very essential to have several elements on the table when planning the design of a hospital. I am very much excited to learn more uh, regarding engineering design innovations for hospital buildings. And my call, Dr. Vivek Desai, the Managing Director, Hosmak India Private Limited. The floor is yours, Dr. Vivek. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Roy. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you are. We can hear you. Yeah, right. Okay. I'm, I'm talking from my car, so I just thought I will just check it. And I might, you know... Uh, drop out of the video, you know, so that my bandwidth remains intact as I talk. So I would request, Akansha, can you just put on my slides? Yeah, sir. Opening. Yeah. So let me begin by thanking IHMR, you know, uh, as usual, uh, very good show, you know, uh, and I'm sure that this would be very successful, Padanya. Uh, 
I've, I'm not an alumni of IHMR, but I've been associated with them since uh, almost about more than 20 years now. No. So uh, as Dr. Roy said, that uh, hospital engineering and design, you know, is an integral and important part of uh, hospital management. So we are going to today talk about certain things which are I would say a must as you design a hospital and some new concepts, you know, that have emerged, especially after this pandemic, you know, so I'm going to touch upon that as well. Can we go to the next slide, please? Now, whatever we do in terms of design, we must always design for patient centricity, you know, and as the definition that you see on your screens, as per the Institute of Medicine, it defines it as providing care that is respectful of and responsive to, you know, both are important words, individual patient preferences, needs, and values. Next slide. Next slide, please. Akansha, can you change the slide? Yes, I am doing. Okay. <clears throat> So we, when we design hospitals, you know, the dictum that one needs to follow is that form should always follow the function. That is the key thing. If you make that as one of your key pointers as you are designing hospitals, you know, you will never go wrong. Normally, what we do, the mistake is that we try to build the form first and then we try to fit in, you know, the functions. And that doesn't work because hospitals, you know, our needs are, very peculiar, the flow of patients, you know, how things would work in say, an operation room or an outpatient clinic or whichever area that you choose. All right. So please remember that form should always follow function. Next slide. So when you do that, you know, one of the most important element of hospital design is the structural grid that we, you know, uh, arrive at when we are designing a building. Okay. The structural grid is those four dots that you see, you know, are the four columns in a grid that happen. And normally, you should go for a grid which is between 7.5 meters to 9 meters. You know, that's the kind of grid which is optimal for hospitals. 7.5 would be better for, you know, public hospitals which have general wards and those kind of situation. And going towards 9 you know, would be a better for private corporate kind of setups, you know. So when you design a grid, why do we design a grid of 7.5 to 9 is what you need to understand. It fits in all the functions as you can see on your screen. It takes in an operating room, it takes in a general ward, it takes in a twin room, as well as in the basement, it takes three cars. You know, anything less than this probably will get the, you know, problem with parking as well, which I learned halfway through my consulting career. Next slide. So the grid needs to be modular. Then you need to design whatever you do in terms of engineering should always enhance the patient care. The photographs that you see on your screen are of intensive care units, something which is, you know, extremely important part of any hospital. So you should have, you know, as far as possible, all patients in intensive care unit should have access to window you know, because they should be able to understand whether it's day, it's night, you know, otherwise you have a biological rhythm going haywire if you're... trying to do intubation, the, the, the bed actually should be two feet away from the wall any which way. You should be able to put in an intraortic balloon pump, a ventilator, everything around the bed. You should be able to move all around. So 150 odd square feet, you know, would be optimum. Then hand washing and other kind of things which is required, especially after COVID or you do a, you know, a sanitizer kind of arrangement. You can see a nurse, stay, nurse seated outside too you know, beds and is able to watch the patient, you know, direct. That is the best way that you can try and do. And hand wash also important because most of the infections that we generally give is nosocomial, you know, to, to patients. So we should, uh, 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 you know, avoid to do that. Negative and positive pressure rooms, extremely important, you know, uh, for, for uh, immunosuppressed patient, positive uh, pressure and for 
you know, uh, uh, infective cases like COVID, negative pressure. Next slide. Also, design, you know, whenever you do a design, you need to innovate to, to the customer need. What you are seeing on your screen, I've given you an example of a pediatric ward. You know, so if you are designing for a pediatric patient, remember he is not an adult, you know, so he's not going to respond well to an adult kind of a room, you know. So you customize it to whatever he requires. You know, design it for one plus one because a parent is going to be necessary to be, you know, along with the child. The aesthetics, you know, has to be as per as per uh, his requirements. So, you know, you should have those Mickey Mouses and other things which is there. You could have play areas. You know, so try to try to uh, design to the customer need. Next slide. Personalizing for designing, you know, so suppose this was a maternity kind of a hospital, what you see on your screen is an LDRP suit, you know, which is labor, delivery, recovery and postpartum in the same room. There have been mushrooming of maternity centers now. So, you know, this is something that you are personalizing it for the patient. You know, the family can be around when your baby is getting delivered. The environment is completely homely. The bed doesn't look like a, you know, a patient bed. You know, accessories are all hidden, but it will come out in case you need a forcep delivery or anything of like that. You know, so there would also be in the washroom a jacuzzi for underwater kind of a delivery. You know, so this is like personalizing the design, innovating it to the, you know, requirement of the of the person. Next slide. Now, in some cases, you know, when you are, say, doing dialysis or you're doing chemotherapy or any daycare kind of procedures which are there, where a patient needs to be there for three, four hours, he's already under stress. Both in case of dialysis and chemotherapy, the patient is not in a comfortable situation. So try and make, you know, that uh, as, as comfortable to him as possible in terms of his seating arrangement, in terms of, of accessories around him, you know, curtain for privacy for uh, you know tv in front of him because he's going to be you know three four hours just lying down there doing nothing so these kind of things if you do for patients you know that would reduce the stress they are already in uh, while undergoing a dialysis or a chemotherapy next slide now this pandemic you know there have been certain changes and i think some of these are going to remain with us for a long time, we will need to create waiting areas which are much bigger than what they were if you need to, you know, have social distancing. All right. So this is going to, no, you need to go back. You know, this is going to uh, uh, go back, go back. Yeah. You know, uh, this is going to probably have an impact on the area per bed, which is probably going to increase. Flexibility of the grid, I've already mentioned. There would be need for quicker you know, build up of hospitals. So pre-engineered buildings, you know, what we saw in China happening, hospitals getting up within 10 days, 15 days, you know, those kind of things. So we will use, we like to use materials which are, you know, uh, conducive to do that. Technology would be used for low touch or no touch, you know, kind of a thing. So door opening by feet, robot deliveries in hospitality, you know, hands-free wash basins, urinal, sanitizable doors, floors, you know, you cannot use... Uh, 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 tapestry, which is cloth, you will need to bring in material which can be sanitized. You know, germicidal coatings will come on high touch points like taps and the door handles and things like that. Lift buttons, for example, will be, you know, like that. Uh, thermographs at entry, public gathering places to identify people. So these are some of the things, you know, which are coming in now, you know, and, and would stay with us for a longer time. Mobile hospital modules, you know, will become uh, more popular future. Next slide. So pre-engineered buildings, like I said, you know, I think the time has come that we need to imbibe this kind of a, a, a concept. Next. So this was something that we did in India, you know, for Dr. Ramana Loya Hospital in Delhi, you know, where this building, this was of course done about 12 years ago. Hence, there is a 200 days period. Nowadays, you can do this in 20 or 50 days itself, you know. Uh, so there were a lot of things that we used, you know, to cut down the time. You know? So prefabricated steel structures, external walls were large panels, dry walls were used in the interiors, you know, and I will show some of them. Next, next slide. 
this was the structure you know this was set up uh, in about 40 days time next slide this is called as drywall you know so this is not like a brick masonry these are you know aluminium frame as you can see and then on both sides we put gypsum plaster you can see services running inside of these walls they are very lightweight quick you know uh, and you can even you know put weights like that's why i have given there a wc which is hung on it you know so it is not that it cannot take weight it can take weight also and since it doesn't need any plaster it saves water because it is lighter it saves the structural loading you know so from every way that you look at it drywalls are you know are something which is for future and we've started to use it now in most hospitals even in india next slide then engineer you know the design to make hospitals energy efficient hospitals are guzzlers of energy we operate 24/7 into 365 days and as i remember once we did some exercise for cii in india and we realized that we spend about 700 rupees per bed per day just on electricity cost so the more you work on you know uh, making the hospital uh, energy efficient the more you will gain in the longer run next slide why go green because next this is what you know is the is the thing that you can achieve the energy use going down water use going down solid waste okay so more green you grow you know the better it is for you anyway next slide uh, look at this if you if you put your energies in planning in an air conditioning system and lighting you are you know almost like done so very very careful you know planning of both these elements air conditioning and lighting will help you save almost 30 to 40% of your energy you know bill that you would have next slide uh even a small thing like you know uh, orientation of building you know if you orient a building proper whereby you know uh, harness the north light do not take the south light in which is very hot you know keep the building narrow so that you have ventilation also and you know you don't need to bring light deep inside enough soft scape to allow replenishing of ground water one common mistake we make is you know make concrete everywhere you should make grass pavers if you remember your old houses you know you would have grass pavers and not this full concrete you need to let the water sink in you know that we need to this is not innovation this is basic engineering you know which we need to understand that solar is becoming you know very very commonly used and now we have even window glass which can be used as solar you know there are vendors which are coming in and the cost is dropping one should surely you know innovate with doing something like that next slide uh, if you are no option but to put glass you know uh, you should use at least high performance glass you know whereby it only allows light to come through but it you know stops the heat and the ultraviolet radiation which comes in of course it's a little expensive but you have no other option then you should probably do something like this next water conservation you know uh, very 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 important you know you can have waterless urinals nowadays you know you should probably try and do that reduce reuse recharge stp is now mandatory for hospitals and we should use that you know and use the water for for the air conditioning plants and the landscape and also to probably flush your you know toilets next slide next slide please then the patient centric information technology you know so use of fax picture archival communication systems you have seen this telemedicine has become one of the you know cornerstone of handling this pandemic you know uh, and this i think is going to now remain with us you could also have certain web based apps you know which you could use in your hospitals like a gps you know which will help you to navigate the hospital without you know having to you know go and ask at the reception desk payments of bills managing appointments you know everything can be now done through web based applications next slide smart room control so nowadays you know you can have room control uh, on your fingertips you know uh, you don't have to move around next slide you can do that actually through your mobile phone you know you can uh, put in a uh, app and you can use that it will be very very handy for patient especially at night you know when they want to call uh, i saw in a hospital in mumbai you press the call uh, for the nurse it doesn't the nurse doesn't come uh, a speaker opens up and they ask you for what purpose you need 
you know the nurse to come in so that when they come they come prepared for that rather than coming and then going back and coming back you know so those kinds of things are are now uh, in work next slide there are voice activated this everyone now understands you know we could use something like these in hospital rooms also next slide uh digital registration wayfinding you know how you have on uh, in malls this kind of thing is now been used in hospitals as well and you can do that with an app next slide so i think you know uh, this is my last slide the challenges for designing generally is you know growth of course is inevitable technology will always improvise so design will have to work in tandem with you know the technology a compact well planned value for money hospital this is what india actually needs you know that uh, we need to understand how you know we embrace technology but not you know uh, give up on the cost bit of it and add that value so less is more is you know what should be the emphasis when we innovate uh, for hospital design thank you very much thank you so much uh, dr uh, vivek um Uh, it is very uh, enlightening, and uh, thank you so much for helping us to be more aware of these innovations, uh, particularly about modular grid design and also go green, uh, which is very environmental friendly hospital, and also patient centric information uh, technology. Uh, considering the discussion of Dr. Vivek regarding engineering design innovations for uh, hospital buildings, I may conclude that. Majority of the hospital is in drastic, yeah, the drastic need for innovation. Like, so a big question is how do we design a hospital for uncertain future due to COVID nineteen and also uh, other emerging diseases to come? I think uh, Dr. Vivek would agree with me that uh, flexibility, flexibility is now the most valuable components. Of healthcare buildings, and one of the many lessons of this crisis is that our flexibility of space is paramount to uh, enable uh, optimum resilience and provide readiness for the unknown. Uh, Dr. Vivek, I have only one question. Um, healthcare buildings play a very significant role in delivering healthcare services. And outcomes, and the research suggests that there is a high correlation between the healthcare environment, or say hospital environment, and patient outcome. Can you comment on this? Hospital environment and patient. Yes. So you know, uh, indoor air quality, for example, you know, is one of the key components of, uh, of of this fact. You know, and this pandemic has made us realize that if the indoor air quality is not good. We have had hospitals shutting down because of the cross infection, you know, which goes from place to place. Apart from that, there are many other things that you can do, you know, to to improve mm -hmm. the patient uh, outcomes in terms of how you lay out. You know, say for simple example, in an orthopedic ward, if you enable the patient with a handrail right going from his to his bed to his toilet, you know, he would be very happy, you know, to <laughs> to 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 work work with something like that. You would use less manpower also, you know, to to do that. But I would say that you know, in terms of say intensive care units, you know, uh, the distances between beds. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, I agree. Uh, the, the, the go a very long way in improving, you know, the patient outcomes. Yeah, I agree with you, Doctor Vivek. Uh, when we talk about the the quality, we talk about not only the process but the structure and outcome, which I agree with you. And and so the hospital structure uh, design needs a lot of attention on the facility design so that it has an impact on the patient and also uh, staff satisfaction. Of patients' stress experience also, and organizational or performance metrics. I think this is a very good area for research to venture, Dr. Vivek. And again, thank you so much, Dr. Vivek, and uh, thank you so much for sharing your insights. All right, let's move to uh, another topic. Uh, it is amazing to look back and see uh, how just far our world has come technologically. And the same can be said about technology in healthcare. As the digitalization of healthcare continued to expand through the industry, innovative medical technologies are set to deliver a substantial new values opportunities 
to those hospital organizations. And to this modern technology, even uh, doctors allow uh, making diagnosis without looking at the patients. Hospital uh, use uh, robots to deliver food and medicine, and even surgeons use robotic arms to serve patients from across the room. And, and that is very amazing. So let us hear how can healthcare organizations be innovative in the present day, and what are the organiz or what are the innovations deserve your in our attention. So let us hear more from Dr. Joy Chakraborty, uh, the Chief Operating Officer of PD Hinduja Hospital. Uh, the floor is yours, Dr. Joy. Thank you, Professor Dr. Roy, and. Thanks to the entire fraternity of IHML for inviting me in this Pradhan year 2022. So again, I'm, I'm not, I think someone is echoing, please switch off the other device if you have two devices next to each other. So I'm not an ex student, but my connection goes with IHML in terms of being a part of the uh, academic board of the institute and I'm very proud to say the kind of students this institute is producing every year and it is very nice to see their future progress. So I request uh, Akanksha to put my presentation on, on the screen. So I'm going to take next 12 to 15 minutes to talk about the changes what has taken place in the technological point of view in a hospital and how it is helping in patient uh, care, diagnosis, in terms of operations, in all these areas. So can I have my presentation up? Yeah. So uh, though I have written the topic innovation in healthcare through technology, uh, most of my points are going to cover the non-clinical part of it. It is taken for granted. I heard about the robotic arm, the robots and all. Of course, all of us, we are very much thorough and we know about it. So I'm not going to dwell upon those points further, but I'll focus on mostly on the applications in the non-clinical areas. Next slide, please. So in terms of, uh, this is going to be the flow of my presentations, next. So what we notice now we are very familiar with the terminology called industry 4.0. So what is this 4.0? The first it came on the basis of in 18th century, the steam based machines. Then it came electrical energy based mass production. Then it came third industrial revolution, computer and internet based knowledge. And then finally, what we are seeing for the last couple of years from the beginning of 21st century and in probably in healthcare, it has been adopted much later, that is the fourth industrial revolution and where the major contribution has been made by things like artificial intelligence, information technology, big data, IoT, cloud, blockchain, and all sorts of, you know, uh, new, uh, I should say, components of technology, which is making healthcare much more interesting area and making healthcare revolution across the globe. Next one. So I need not to talk about the topic, what is innovation and what is health technologies. I have in some of the slides, very heavy text and I have kept it purposefully because I know the background of the audience is mostly students. So at the end of the day, they get some message, they get some content for their own purposes. So I have kept some of the heavy text. Next one. So what we have seen in innovation in terms of technology in healthcare, we have seen at the beginning, whenever we spoke about technology, we spoke about, you know, the way medical technologies improved and developed. I give a very common example of gallbladder surgery. Many of us are very familiar. What happened in that part of it? So it used to be earlier, a very open kind of surgery. Then it came laparoscopic surgery. So you don't need to make such a big cut. Uh, you just put three holes and with that you operate. 
and then it came seals single incision laparoscopic surgery where you make much lesser you know in uh, uh, things skin on skin you make much lesser lesion and you still operate so that was one example of the evolution of technology in the clinical part but similarly if you look at in all other aspects with the help of artificial intelligence diagnostics bits have improved tremendously with the help of big data you can plan you can design your delivery part of it the service part of it that which patient needs to be treated in which way which patient needs what kind of intervention and i'll be talking about sometimes about personalized medicine and other aspect of it next slide so i'll start with artificial intelligence one of the very you know uh, popular uh, terminology today not only in healthcare in almost all the possible areas so what all it does i'm sure it will be interesting for the students to see and most importantly what you should see after this program where all it is getting applied and you must have some real case studies available with you so the early detection of elements i may not be able to touch upon everything in details but just to give you in uh, you know we have a rural program for our hospital where in the rural remote areas we can't expect a very expert specialist to go and check the eyesight of the villagers so we have this artificial intelligence based system where through that mobile you can take a photo of the eyes and from there you can find out what are the who are all are having a high risk either you accumulate them and get your doctor once and get them diagnosed or you can pick up them and bring them to the hospital and get it done so this is the way it has been done similarly you know different images whether it is for the breast cancer and other things you can see a lot of applications improving decision making so as i mentioned to you that the algorithm of artificial intelligence helps in many occasions a quick decision making help in treatment expanded access to medical services associated care so giving a superior experience so there are many of these things have got integrated in our healthcare delivery ecosystem and that has become possible only because of artificial intelligence next so as i was giving examples these are some of the examples like you can do diagnosis quickly you can see you know virtual follow ups personalized dosage you can recommend on the basis of whatever artificial intelligence gives you as a, a support to make a quick and correct decision making next blockchain technology for the healthcare industry so blockchain again came up in a different way in all other sectors but you can see that data security though it is a concern but it is working in a big way in terms of supply chain and many other areas and especially in the western world whether it is insurance claim processing whether it is managing a huge uh, i should say in the healthcare delivery system when you are required to address a patient for a longitudinal timeline basis you can get a lot of inputs through this health blockchain technology next so this is the kind of market what where what we have in front of us and i'm sure it is going to grow further next virtual healthcare so uh, before me dr desai was talking about uh, you know online and virtual and all so this virtual healthcare has been proved a very successful model in last two years after covid where the doctors consultation appointment everything has become possible very easily and thanks to indian entrepreneurs and startups they have you know uh, welcome this uh, virtual healthcare concept and lot of these solutions have come up and let me tell you that soon after the second wave of covid when there was study conducted by one of the big consulting firm um they have got a report and records which says 
that clinicians who were earlier not very comfortable with doing this virtual healthcare, they have welcomed and almost 57% of them have told, we will continue to have this virtual healthcare, virtual consultation for our patients for a simple reason. Now we have understood that what does it mean and how convenient it for me as well as for my patients. Patients, those who have avail virtual healthcare, 73% of them have told that in future we'll continue to have this because it is very convenient. I need not to travel wherever I am in terms of geography. I can have access to my doctors and I can get treatment without any delay. Next. So this is again a slide what I mentioned about that for your studies and academic purpose. But here you can see the virtual health could be one of the most critical element to address increasing number of patients, higher utilization, distributed patient geography. So as I was mentioning, all these aspects can be improved by using virtual healthcare and measuring value of virtual health. You can have from six value streams. One is critical outcomes, quality, safety. So you need to look at the six important component which will ensure whether you are in the right track. If the patient and family experience through virtual healthcare is not going to help you, then it, that is not good. So you need to ensure that in your virtual healthcare, you have all these components and all those components are meeting patients' expectations. Next. So Internet of Medical Things, I need not to talk much about this, but this remote monitoring and as well as automation, adaptability, patients, uh, you know, triggers a lot of these, um, you know, signals which can help people to make an early response to a critical problem of the patient or a delayed response can lead to a very critical condition. So Internet of Medical Things is another thing which is coming up in a big way. Next. Next. Precision medicine. So I'm not sure how many of you, as mostly I'm asking the students, you're familiar with the precision medicine. So precision medicine is meant, uh, started in the Western world, especially in US and place like Stanford or Mayo, where a patient is treated after studying the condition of their particular you know, health condition. So if there are two diabetic patients, both of them are not treated in the similar way, depending upon their own genetic condition, depending upon their own internal health conditions, they have been treated. And this is, a, this is something like precision medicine. And in some places also the personalized medicine uh, you know, word comes and that, uh, that will be you know, a very uh, good intervention, I can tell you, in this country. Uh, when we are treating so many, such a huge population, if we are able to implement this, if you are able to adopt this, probably that can give a better clinical outcome. Next. 3D printed devices. And uh, I think what you need to know that there are so many organs and other things are getting now printed, which are giving solutions to several problems including organ failures, then it helps in medical diagnosis training. It is helping in several surgical training. So this is going to be the way forward and we need to you know, uh, welcome and we need to see that how we can get the best possible outcome from this technology. Next, virtual reality. So, Virtual reality, I'm not sure how much it has come to India, but again in the Western world for several purposes, like for medical training, or, uh, you know, you know what, what you call uh, uh, that simulation training for that purpose, for robotic surgery, for many of the many things, this virtual reality has come into the picture. And a couple of years back, I happened to attend uh, event in Cleveland Clinic where there is a department of virtual reality related medical treatment and they have shown how they can bring better patient experience 
better clinical outcome in a shortest possible time. So that has been made possible. Next. I'm so sorry, Mr. Joy, but uh, you have two minutes to finalize your presentation. I think I'm just one slide away. Okay, thank you so much. So, but what we need to know and understand that whatever hazards are there when you go ahead and adopt this, uh, you know, uh, technology, you have to be prepared for that. The next slide. So there are so many things I need not to read out all this cyber security, data theft, data related issues. And, uh, you know, uh, we have in India problems of Wi-Fi availability, the connect of uh, the nature of connectivity, the ability of what we have, all this needs to be looked into before we really imbibe all this. Next. And final slide. So effective use of technology is important to deliver healthcare. By leveraging technology, you can bring down lack of access and cost of healthcare. So when you develop and you want to adopt technology, please ensure that you are looking at the person who is looking support from you, who may not have a huge affordability, but looking for some solution for their health problems. When you are able to address those issues, then you can tell this technology has made real innovation in your healthcare delivery. Thank you and over to Professor. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Choi, for your uh, excellent uh, presentation. And uh, if we see the innovation in the healthcare industry today, uh, as what uh, Dr. Choi, it's a massive improvement in the system. Uh, and this groundbreaking technologies and also uh, the ever growing digitalization of healthcare uh, that mentioned uh, by Mr. Joy can really help to provide uh, this much needed uh, innovation or uh, creating uh, opportunities uh, to boost attractiveness to the patients and also to the staff while uh, improving the patient outcome and efficiency. All right, so we don't have much time. So let us move to the next speaker. Um, technology has played an important role in responding to the novel coronavirus and subsequent uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And also uh, we acknowledge that the crucial role of technology in the response phase of emergency management in hospitals. And using this IT or this information technology, uh, it could help manage the risk and uh, the hazardous effects of the outbreak and also uh, minimize the crisis damages. But uh, this is very interesting topic. So, uh, I mean, I gave the floor to Dr. Uh, Richa Singh uh, Dibgupta, the Senior Vice President Strategy and Operations for this healthcare to share our technological enhancement and hospital management due to pandemic. The floor is yours, Dr. Richa. Thank you, Dr. Roy. Uh, first and foremost, thank you, IHMR, for having me. And uh, thank you everyone for joining in. So uh, I must clarify that the way Dr. Vivek Desai said that he is not the student of IHMR. So as uh, uh, Joy explained that he is not the student, well, let me identify that I am the student of IHMR. I'm an alumni of uh, this prestigious institute and it has a special place in my heart. And, and of course, you know, uh, two years I got groomed there when I was doing my post-graduation and I am, uh, a lot of it can be credited to IHMR and the professors there who have helped me uh, build and choose my career into healthcare. And um, having made this decision 23 years back, I'm extremely happy and uh, happy with what I have been doing and uh, the way I'm contributing to healthcare in India. So with that said, uh, Professor, what I would do is I would move on to my presentation because I know I need to stick on to my 15 uh, minutes. And some of the context has already been set by Joy because we both uh, kind of shared the same uh, topic, but mine would be slight talk more from experience and I would correlate that how it, it kind of works in the healthcare. So if I could request uh, Akanksha to put up my presentation, please. At some point you may, may see my um, camera going off because my bandwidth might not uh, uh, support my voice and face both. Probably they just like to have one at a time, right? So here you go. Now, technological enhancement in hospital management due to pandemic. Uh, I specifically added that due to pandemic, 
Because, you know, I do believe in that if we have to count few good things which pandemic has done to us, they would be far and few. And in terms of impact of the pandemic, I think we, all, we will go on for next few years to assess that how many millions and billions uh, got lost in terms of the economic uh, uh, impact, in terms of the psychological impact, in terms of the education uh, loss which uh, students had across the globe and so on and so forth. However, I think there are only a hand few which we can count that what was the advantage of this pandemic. One was that it accelerated the growth of um, digital transformation, information, information technology transformation. And I say so particularly in healthcare and specifically in healthcare hospitals. Because hospitals, when, when I joined in uh, 2000, right, which is 22 years back, uh, it was extremely, extremely, uh, uh, you know, manual, uh, paper driven, right? And the only thing uh, hospital did was treating patient and nothing else. However, over a period of, of time, hospitals also has got a recognition of an industry, right? For the reason that the number of employment it generates and it is part of our day-to-day -day need, which is good health. And more and more groups are getting into not only treating patients, but also prevention of the disease because that's the best way of uh, dealing with it at country level. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Perfect. So uh, Mr. Joy Chakravarti touched upon that how the industry has grown uh, one, two, three, four. So when we are there on the fourth, looks like, you know, uh, Joy and I would have discussed it and kept it like that, but not really. It was just a coincidence, right? So talking about uh, what is Industry 4.0 advent? See, it is basically based on four principles, and I would correlate it with the healthcare providers, hospitals. So first and foremost thing, it says that it has to have interoperability. Okay. Now, what does that mean is that, uh, see, this is like, you know, your machine, your device, whatever is there, it needs to be connected. It, it needs to be connected in a way that it can communicate, right? So let's let's take an example that if I'm a patient of XYZ hospital and I go on vacation in Northeast, trust me, whenever I travel there, I dread that, uh, you know, what happens if something happens to me? What, what do you know if I kind of uh, fall? What happens if, you know, my blood pressure, blood pressure fluctuate? If, what if my parents are traveling with me and, you know, they have some problem? So see, this solves your problem to a large extent that today, you can pick up the phone and talk to the doctor, do a teleconsult. And if the hospital fortunately has EMR, the doctor would have all the records to see if you have some allergy, if you have some pre-condition, if you have some morbidity before he prescribes the medicine to you. So we have reached to that level. And of course, that's something which is interoperability goes very well with the healthcare as well. Now let's talk about the technical assistant. Now technical assistant is something which we are saying that when we are making a decision as human, if we have, so uh, in management, you know, a lot of time we debate that what is more uh, important? Is it the gut feel, which comes from the experience probably, right? Or is it the uh, factual data? I would say it is both. Your, I, I would not like to underplay your experience in terms of sometimes you do get a feel that it may be like this. But when it's supported by the data, that's something which really helps. So technical assistant goes very well with healthcare as well. Decentralized decision. Uh, you would recollect of the days those who are running hospitals or have worked with the hospitals uh, among all of us and students, of course. So um, uh, most of the time we used to say that, you know, it has to be um, up to down in the sense that the management sitting up is making the decision and it is getting passed on to the people down there. But now for making it more efficient, it decentralized decision is the, is the need of the day. And this data, the, these uh, Basic things helps you make decentralized decision. A mid management can take certain decision. Higher management management can take certain decision, and a person sitting on the billing desk is also able to make a decision. I'll give you a simple example. Like if you are sitting and you have an AI on your billing estimate, you exactly know how much to tell for a cardiac surgery. What should be the price for that? If you have on a button of uh, on a on a click of a button, if you have an estimate. As to last six months, CABG, if I have done, what's the average of that? So that's the strength of uh, technology, and that's that's what is the new innovation in healthcare. 
Information transparency, again, I would take the same example because many of us are from healthcare and many of us actually use healthcare services. And the bitter point and the patient dissatisfaction come in when you don't have your bill matching the estimate that was given, right? So information transparency. Now, if somebody has an issue, I can always show them that while my average CABG bill is two lakh of rupees, but guess what? You had a longer ICU stay and hence your price is much more or your bill is much more. If you can go to the next slide, please. Now, what are the components of this industry? So robotic process automation, Internet of Things, cloud computing, augmented reality, big data, AI, and machine learning. Obviously, I'm not going to read all of this because I'm, I'm sure this, this presentation will get circulated to all of you. A few things which I would like to pick up is the big data is one thing which I would like to talk about. Now, what's big data? It's, it's very simple to understand without going by the definition. See, all the data that you're generating because of your digitalization, which is primarily your patient-related data, and some of the management-related data, it could be consumption, it could be um, your, your patient's bill, and is, is getting collected. So that is what it, it's called big data. It's very simple to understand. Now, what can it do? It can do actually miracle. When we talk about artificial intelligence, which is the next topic, right, which is the next heading. So when you are doing artificial intelligence, this is also pretty simple. As the word goes artificial and intelligence, anything which human was supposed to do, but because of the data analytics, uh, a computer or, or, or a, uh, AI uh, uh, instrument is giving you is something which is AI. Uh, uh, it enables your decision making much better. We can go to the next slide, please. Now, I think this would be good to understand, leaving the technical part of it, because uh, we, we did see uh, what, what innovation in terms of technology is there in the previous presentation. Now, if I talk about how is this technological disruption is going to change the customer journey, first and foremost, omni-channel communication. And I would explain you all this with very simple examples. Let me talk about that if a patient wanted an appointment with a doctor in a hospital, what would you do? There were only two simple things which you could do. One, you walk up to the hospital or you walk up to the nursing home clinic, go physically take an appointment. Second thing could be that you call up uh, the, the place and you will uh, uh, get an appointment through the phone. But in today's world, see there are multiple channels which has opened up thanks to te technology. It could be your website, it is mobile app, it could be social media. It could be once you enter the hospital, you need not stand in that long queue. You simply use the kiosk, which has been placed in the lobby. And of course, I said the physical visit. So that's the reason we're calling it omni-channel communication. There are multiple ways that you can communicate with the hospital, and it makes it easier for you to access the healthcare. Right? So further on, if we talk about it, it also kind of... Uh, um, if I if I purely talk about the number of patients that you serve, that also improves. And your manpower resource is much better utilized because those who are using chaos, those who are using your app, they're not taking away the time for your customer care who are busy handling the other patients. Now, the second thing, if we talk about telemedicine, telemedicine, as they say that we started the journey in 2000, when ISRO came up with this proposal that teleconsult is something which can be easily done. And a lot of other hospitals group came into it, right? So it was uh, Narayana, it was Apollo. They started with it. But uh, frankly speaking, in the last 20 years, the number of consult uh, all put together that we would have done, we have done it in last eight to nine months time when the pandemic was at, at its peak. If I talk about Portis Healthcare Group, around 50% of our total consult numbers, which runs in a few thousands, were done through telemedicine. And as they say that... Uh, um, necessary is the mother of invention. I think it, it held absolutely, absolutely true there. And uh, I must appreciate government's move on this, that they were very quick in coming with the guidelines, which helped everyone that how teleconsult needs to be used. Uh, and, and I think that was one of the way we stayed connected with our patients and patients stayed connected with, connected with their doctors. And as uh, uh, Joy was talking about some of the survey that has been conducted, uh, most of the patients and the doctors are more than willing to continue to use this as a tool of interaction, as a tool of consultation or staying connected with the uh, service provider. Now, digital supply chain goes back again uh, to 
to the time when uh, you know when you enter into the admin area the maximum crowd you would see of the people who have come either to take their money uh, they are the suppliers right or they have come to uh, submit a tender which you have taken it out for for certain services or or for certain equipment then there could be people who have come to submit the bills now all of that that crowd has gone away reason being everything is digitalized everything is now online right so uh, this is this is what uh, has changed the world digital supply and also the online payment so so you know it is so very much convenient let's go to the next slide please disease surveillance now if we if we if we think about aragya setu app again praising the government for what they have done during this pandemic now if this was not there if oven was not there i really wonder how we would have monitored this because i do remember the day, days when you know these um, uh, uh, people who would come to uh, give the polio uh, uh, vaccine uh, uh, to the kids they would go door to door they would have hordes and loads of paper registers where they would keep entering everything right but it has so fast tracked the things now look if you look at the coven app it has been so very efficient and many of the hospitals struggle that how do they kind of you know maintain maintain this uh, crm with their patients in terms of sending them messages and sending them reminders but then this particular app actually gives you a reminder that now this is the time for your booster dose right so these are a few things which are an example to tell you that how technology is changing the world i do see that some of the people who are commenting or asking questions somebody has said that you know uh, touching the patient or palpating palpating the patient is still the best way yes i agree uh, so at no point i'm saying that we are going to kind of uh, go away from the physical consults i'm i'm not saying that the the physical interaction the the social interaction is going to go away and we are going to be completely technology bound please do relate that we are there to exist its technology is just an enabler which makes your life easier which make processes efficient so coming on to the remote patient monitoring some of the chronic disease doctors who are friends who work with us right they are so very happy with because they also don't want and especially in such time that you know you keep coming to me you keep following up with me after every week right so what they do is especially for diabetic patient right or or the cardiac patient they track your uh, uh, pressure they track your regular uh, 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 blood uh, uh, blood sugar so all all these are modalities which are helping again connect doctor and patient almost on day to day basis robotic surgery nothing to talk about it while people still continue to debate in terms of the advantage of robotic over the non uh, 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 over the regular uh, procedure or surgery uh especially from the point of view of the cost let me highlight here let's see robotic surgery it costs more because when you invest in a equipment which is so very expensive obviously and and you're doing only 100 surgeries then the cost gets divided and it is expensive in a country like india i think lot of things lot of things work and our advantage is um uh, economy of scale if you start doing it in huge numbers the cost gets distributed and it becomes uh quite reasonable next slide please right so what are the next steps um uh, to build a resilient healthcare system so it is about ai assisted assisted diagnostics so i'll tell you within fortis network uh, we are exploring to have uh, uh, ai assisted radiological services while we have not gone to ct and mri but what we are exploring currently is that because of the pattern because of the uh, opacity because of the uh, because of the way the x-ray looks if you feed in a um, few thousands of x-ray it has the intelligence to tell you that you know probably these 80% x-rays are normal so i was talking to one of very senior uh, radiologists in our network and she said that richa easily 80% of the work can be taken away for the x-ray reporting if we have this tool and again it is a lot of people fear that are we going to replace people with machines so no that's not the intent see we have we we all know that resources in healthcare is scarce um super specialized doctor if you talk about radiologist we struggle to get a good radiologist right 
And that's where the teleradiology concept came in, that somebody is sitting at, uh, at a remote location or, or somewhere far from where you are. And then through a back system or, 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 or any other mechanism, they're reporting your uh, CTs, MRIs, and, and so on and so forth. Some of the Western countries have outsourced it, this to India. But in this case, if I have to write a normal X-ray, normal X-ray, and if artificial intelligence can tell me that, yes, 99% it's a normal X-ray, then somebody has to just glance it that it don't really have to kind of, you know, keep looking at it. So that's how it saves time and hence it saves the resource, right? Healthcare professional uh, skill, skill uh, skilling platform, without any offense to any of the doctors. See, um, uh, I have uh, many times I have thought that uh, when we have simulation for an aviation industry, why is that it should not be there for the doctors, right? Because what you do is you would have heard that, um, you know, um, I, I kind of I'm observing under so and so surgeon who's a who's a big shot who really knows his work. Right. And I'm learning from him. But then matter of fact is that you tell a patient that X, Y, Z is going to operate on you who's operating it for the first time. I promise you that patient would run away from the table. Right. But. I know the real, real learning would happen when he's doing it, when his professor is doing it and he's assisting him. But the matter of fact is the simulation to a large extent gives you that exposure that what can go wrong, how you're supposed to do it, what, what could be on the table that you should be aware of. It will preempt you with that, right? So that's where I talk about this. And of course, the same thing applies for a nurse as well. That nurse, a fresh nurse who's trying to resuscitate a patient who has had a MI is, is a bit... Uh, would be a bit better if she has practiced it on a, uh, a demo thing or has done something with um, simulation. Okay, now this uh, national digital health ecosystem again, this is something which is a very, very ambitious project, but it's a visionary project, I must say, right? Because in this, uh, uh, what happens is that, uh, you know, you, you're going to get all your patients register, you're going to get all your service providers register, you're going to get all your uh, doctors register, you're going to have a uh, live online uh, EMR. I think that's a dream, dream come true. You know, it would, it would ensure uh, quality, it would ensure continuity of care and much more. Uh, this is one topic, you know, which probably I can, I can talk for a whole day. Now, electronic med medical record, I, I again, I mean, uh, one can't, emphasize and re-emphasize the importance of this. And Uberization of referral uh, transport system is something which I would like to definitely talk about. See, um, today we keep saying that what are the number of ambulances that you need in a country of a population of this 1.3 billion, right? But in this, what you need to also realize is how many ambulances you have seen parked on the road, on the sides, you know, while somebody is really kind of uh, really looking for an ambulance. So when Uber can happen, when Ola can happen, why can't the same technology apply for ambulances if the whole city ambulances can be pulled in together, right? And then you have a, a GPS system set into it. If I'm calling from say, uh, 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 Green Park in Delhi, right? Uh, I, I should be able to locate which is the nearest uh, ambulance that's there because today the mentality is such, unless otherwise it's an accident case, if, if you have somebody who has had MI at home, what you would do is rather than calling an ambulance, you would immediately take the person into your car and rush toward the hospital. However, we can't undermine the role of an ambulance because it is prepared. There would be a person who, who's, who's ready to, or who's trained to deal with such situation, right? But then we have to have this confidence that ambulance can reach before any delay uh, or, or without any delay, and then can take the patient to the hospital. So that's something which you have this live GPS system and uh, Uberization of referral transport system is what I have called it. Next slide, please, and I'm almost done. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Richa, for uh, the wonderful presentation. Uh, I really learned a lot from you, Dr. Richa. And, um, you know, I have one question, uh, Dr. Richa. Uh, you know, for future uh, pandemics are likely to come, definitely. And I strongly believe that the emerging technologies can uh, uh, mitigate the threats of COVID-19 and future pandemics. However, uh, the use of technologies to combat the pandemic um, raises challenges such as uh, security, uh, privacy, um, 
bias, ethics, and also digital divide. Uh, can you please comment on this, Dr. Richard? So, um, I'm sorry, Dr. Roy, I couldn't get your question actually. Yeah, uh, uh, the, the use of technologies to combat right. the pandemic uh, raises challenges as, as the security. You know, you, you mentioned about the big data a while ago. And then oh, what can be the possible challenges with regards to security, about the privacy and I don't know, ethics? And sometimes they are also linking with digital divide now. Uh, uh, can you please comment on this? Sure. So, mm -hmm. so Dr. Roy, I think that's the biggest, biggest challenge that we have. Right. Mm. So people have moved to digitalization because we worried that, you know, your physical data storage or, or MRD, what you call it, where you have all the medical record, what happens if fire uh, yeah. catches up. Right. But I think all of us who are moving and which is the whole population, we need to be also aware that what are the ways we need to protect ourselves from this digital theft, digital, you know, uh, uh, malfunction, whatever can happen. So why? Mm -hmm. if, uh, so I'll, I'll tell you very frankly that as much we are investing into IT, probably the similar amount is getting into the data security uh, as well, because mm -hmm. these data tools are, ex these, these uh, security tools are expensive. But having mm -hmm. said that, if you're not prepared to uh, uh, spend on that, one should not really start this journey because you, you are risking patients uh, data, which can be a huge, I mean, actually one can hold you sabotage uh, if, if somebody gets, on, uh, gets, gets their hand onto your data. So I agree with you. Yes, there, there's a lot of security protocols which are required. And uh, when I spoke about this National Digital Health Mission, and I'm sure uh, Dr. Arora would know it uh, well, uh, they, they also have a large plan on the security, accessibility, and uh, using this data uh, ethically. All right. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. Uh, I really wanted to touch more on the digital divide. Um, I mean, you know, uh, inequalities and digital divide. It's, it, it is very good to hear about this technological advancement. But I think um, we don't notice that there are some individuals who are really left behind. And, and you have to remember that the main goal of SDG is to ensure that uh, no one must be left behind. Um, I even read um, in WHO that about 51% of the world's population uh, does not subscribe to the mobile internet, which is majority can be seen in the low and to the middle income countries. And, there are also reports uh, restricted mobile internet access, such as uh, in the areas of Myanmar, which have left some populations unaware of the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, this outbreak has also disproportionately affected to some communities, uh, especially to the vulnerable individuals. So how about the elderly groups? How about the uh, marginalized people, the disabled individuals, or uh, is this technological enhancement is, is really inclusive to everyone? And uh, we really need to improve the digital literacy, the, the digital skills, uh, democracy, social mobility, uh, economic equality and economic growth, because all of this have an impact on our health outcomes. And what is the role of our education industry to solve this digital divide also? So I think solving in this area is the most challenging in my opinion. The government, uh, the, uh, the NGOs, including the community must work together to address this issue. And yeah, according to um, Dr. Richa, there's a lot of, of uh, possible challenges you know, with this technological advancement. But I think it, in the long run, later on, the long run later on, we can able to uh, you know, to address this one by one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Richia, for this uh, very for your very good presentation. I really thank appreciate you. it. Yeah. So um, let's move on to the next speaker. Um, digital health and artificial intelligence have a really an important role to play in the healthcare offerings in the future. So we will discuss uh, today about digital health and artificial intelligence. And uh, these technologies um, have also touched up by Dr. Um, Richard and also Dr. Uh, uh, Mr. Joy about artificial intelligence. And these technologies has really have the potential to transform many aspects of patient care. And there are already numbers of research studies suggesting that uh, AI or artificial intelligence can really perform as well or uh, better than humans as the key healthcare tasks, such as diagnosing disease. And today, uh, algorithms are already outperforming radiologists at spotting malignant tumors. You know, I saw you know, some of the 
um, uh, research uh, regarding about spotting, you know, these uh, malignant tumors. And it is really very amazing that this AI really, you know, outperforming the geologists and also guiding the researchers in how to construct the cohorts to costly clinical trials. And so let us see if there is a possibility that in the future, artificial uh, intelligence replaces humans for broad medical process domains. Uh, this is really quite very interesting to discuss. And may I invite Dr. Sumana Arora, the senior, senior consultant of NITI, IO Government India. The floor is yours, Dr. Sumana. Thank you so much, Dr. Roy. Um, and thank you, IHMA, for having me. Uh, having been the last speaker, most of what I want to say has already been said. So I'll spare the audience repetition and maybe run through the slides. And I'll request Akansha if I could share my screen, please. Uh, and I'll just take control and run through the slides. And I'll be uh, switching off my video because my bandwidth won't be able to hold up. Uh, so I'm here to speak about innovations in hospital management. Sorry, uh, is my slide visible? Yes, we can see it, Dr. Sumit. Okay, great. One second. So hospital is basically a human invention and as such can be reinvented at any time, honestly. These are some of the sites uh, we are all too familiar with, patients waiting to see their doctors, this is now changing to telemedicine at the safety and security of your house. You can just access the doctor at a click of a button. We are used to seeing patient records in the forms of reams of paperwork, which is now changing to digital records. We see traditional ways of doing surgery. And now the very real possibility of 3D operating models that allow surgeons to practice complex operations before the actual surgery. 3D printing allows for creating an exact replica of the patient's um, organs. And this helps reduce the duration of surgery, reduce blood loss, reduce the risk of complications, reduce the time that patient has to be under anesthesia and hence improve outcomes. One of the previous speakers was talking about simulation. So this is a very real example of simulation. And this is actually happening in some of the hospitals. For example, Boston Children's Hospital. So obviously it's, it's a very fast changing world and we cannot quite explore a new world with old maps. It's truly a world of uh, homo digitus. We have come far away from homo sapiens and patient is now at the center of the healthcare universe. Coming specifically to innovations in hospital management. Um, just for ease of understanding, let us explore these un under two main subheads, clinical and clinical support. Now clinical, both pre-hospital care, intra-hospital care and post-discharge care. Pre-hospital care, uh, uh, we are seeing innovations wherein getting a patient ready for surgery through telemedicine or digital platforms. Many a times we see people land up in hospital, their sugars are wonky, they've forgotten to stop their blood thinners so they can't undergo a surgery. So things like these are now being taken over outside of the hospital setting, in the pre-hospital uh, setting, which is most likely the patient's homes, wherein through telemedicine and through digital platform, they get the pre patient prepped for surgery. Intra-hospital care. Now, there's a lot of um, interesting work that's happening here. 3D models is what we discussed already. Big data. Big data is being used to comb through large data sets and provide faster and more accurate diagnosis. Uh, robotics. Now, there's something called a heart lander, which is basically a miniature mobile robot, which delivers minimally invasive therapy to the surface of a beating heart. So traditional surgery is you need to access the heart and you need to cut through the chest wall. This does away with all of that and hence reduces the damage caused by accessing the heart through traditional approach. Currently being used for ablation for heart, atrial fibrillation, lead placement for bioventricular pacing. Predictive analytics has come a long way for chronic diseases. For example, if you have a diabetic patient, now whether that patient is going to end up in retinopathy, neuropathy or nephropathy can actually be predicted using predictive analysis and uh, appropriate corrective action can be planned on time. 
post hospital discharge now this um once the patient undergoes say a surgery or a medical uh, admission in a hospital post discharge the patient has to follow up with his or her doctor at a periodic uh, interval now between discharge date and the follow up the patients are being followed up on digital platforms and this is actually improving clinical outcomes and reduce picking up signs very early to prevent complications we'll see an example of this later down in the slides clinical support now hospital planning and design is also being implemented in very different ways now there's a hospital in pennsylvania which is actually doing away with the uh, traditional departments in hospitals say cardiology orthopedics laboratory pathology etc and it is coming up with an entirely new design where it is putting the patient at the center it's using technology and it's integrating telemedicine services within the new design of the hospital there are also um, uh, you know, somebody mentioned earlier about virtual reality so there are apps being developed wherein uh, and glasses being developed wherein say for example a mother is undergoing going through the process of childbirth so they put on those virtual reality glasses and help reduce the stress and strain around it patient delight now premi and you app is developed by the university of chicago children's hospital where the parents can stay connected with the newborn even after the parents have left the hospital when the newborn is in the nicu operational bottlenecks we um, people who run hospitals are very well versed with problems of or turn around times so there have been um, cases wherein predictive analysis again has been used to reduce bottlenecks in the turnaround times in operation theaters these are actually combined used combining real time data and ai powered algorithms university of chicago in fact uh, the the hospital of university of chicago medical center has used this and reduced the turnaround time by almost 20% thereby leading to a cost saving of 600000 dollars per annum now let us look at some illustrations of what i just mentioned we'll just stop with this video sorry is the audio can you hear the audio we can hear dr suman you can hear the audio all right we can sorry. we can we can okay. okay sorry about that this is not a test these are real working nurse robots in bangkok thailand handling medical records and pills oh. Dr. Sumana, uh, are you showing us a video? Yeah. Uh, are you able we can to see the video? Uh, uh, we can see on this slide, uh, slide number three. Sorry, you're not able to see the video? No. Uh, let me try again. Otherwise, we'll skip to the next slide. Akanksha, will you be able to help in this? Can you please help Akanksha? Thank you. Akansha, would you like to take over the uh, use the slides yourself, and maybe it'll work then. All right, let me give it another try. Otherwise, we'll go ahead. I am trying, but it is not opening. Okay, let me try again. Uh, please do stop me if you can't see the video. This is not a test. These are real working nurse nurse robots in Bangkok, Thailand, handling medical records and uh, Dr. Sumana, we can and even see the video. Can no video. Me? No video. This Only audio is uh, can be heard. All right. So maybe we can just skip it then. Uh, going on to this is a very interesting um, piece of. video and audio visual uh, you know demonstration of how robotics are actually working today so let's skip that or maybe in the slides that we share the people can see it apologies for that uh, coming on to the next slide you know this is how a traditional stethoscope is this is how we use a stethoscope as doctors but what do you do in a pandemic how do you auscultate your patient 
So innovation closer home in India. This is what some of the Indian doctors came up with. Now this unfortunately is again a video. Please let me know if you can see this it. This is what they have made. Uh, they have cut a stethoscope into the proximal part, uh, part and they bought a small Bluetooth, routine Bluetooth device and they just opened up and then take, took the mic and then kept it under the... Uh, I'm so sorry, the proximal part of it's still with you. Yeah. All right. So basic, basically what he has done here is that they have used the diaphragm and the bell of the stethoscope, put a Bluetooth device, connected it to a phone, and then auscultated a patient without really putting in the earpiece. This, this is a very uh, traditional Indian Indianized version of the device, but there are commercial devices available also in the market, which are called stemoscopes. Going on to the post-op follow-up on a digital platform. Now, this is something uh, which really blew my mind because I saw it firsthand. Having, now, this, there's a little uh, bit of a personal story behind it. Now, when I was the medical director of one of Asia's leading hospitals, I remember a patient brought into the ER who had just been discharged 15 days ahead earlier. And uh, it was a post-CABG patient elderly woman went into depression unnoticed by the clinical team and the family climbed up the 15th floor of her apartment complex and jumped down. So I remember being very distressed uh, post that and wondering how do we prevent such a scenario. This was something which gave me the answer almost a decade later. This actually happened uh, two years back and uh, a patient post-operative knee replacement was onboarded for recovery and rehabilitation on the digital platform. A multidisciplinary team of nurses, physiotherapists, dietitians, and clinical psychologists were looking at the patient. The clinical psychologist identified mental health issues, pessimism, and borderline suicidal thoughts escalated to the primary surgeon for timely intervention. Now, this is something which was done outside of hospital at the patient's house. The second thing that was done was the surgical site was remotely monitored. So if you see left to right, the extreme left picture here, it's a healthy wound. And then you see it getting infected. Now, this was picked up. Uh, Dr. Sumana, which slide you are referring to? Sorry, can you see my presentation? Yeah. So uh, no, which, which, slide, which slide you are referring number to? Number 10. Oh, we, we, I can see slide number 3. Oh, there seems to be some problem. Let me just... Restart the presentation. Let me just restart it. Now we can see in slide seven, there's a detail. Yeah, so let me just restart it all over again. There seems to be a problem. One second. Or Akancha, can you just put up the slides, please, if you can? There seems to be some lag here. I have shared the, we are on the 10th slide, ma'am. I have shared the screen. You shared the screen? Okay. Yes, ma'am. So uh, I hope it's visible to everybody. Yeah, we can see now. Okay, so this is the case that I was talking about of a post-op follow-up on a digital platform. A 57-year-old uh, post-knee replacement patient was onboarded for recovery and rehab on a digital platform. So this essentially means that the patient was discharged and went home and was followed up on a daily basis by a multidisciplinary team of uh, nurses, physiotherapists, dietitians, and psychologists. The clinical psychologist identified mental health issues, pessimism, and borderline suicidal thoughts, escalated it to the primary surgeon on time for timely intervention. Uh, Akansha, if you can press next. Yeah, so in the previous slide, please. In the same patient, they also were monitoring the wound health remotely through wound pictures. Now, if you see from left to right, extreme left is a fairly healthy wound. And as it progresses to the right, you see infection developing. So even before the patient could physically go and visit the orthopedic surgeon because the patient was from another city, the digital uh, clinical team picked it up, escalated it, and informed the treating surgeon and immediate intervention was done. So we are seeing how digital is actually making a difference in clinical outcomes. And going forward, this whole piece can actually be 
um, you know, uh, digitized or automated using AI algorithms once they get enough wound images. Next, please. So we so far were speaking about the hospital system, but hospital doesn't exist in isolation. Like one of the chat messages was mentioning that it's not just the internal, uh, you know, environment in the hospital, but also the external. Next, please. So innovations within hospitals are actually part of the innovations in the larger healthcare ecosystem. Next, please. Now, this is what we see happening in India today. The Ayushman Bharat Digital Health Mission. Like I think Dr. Cha was mentioning, it's a fantastic initiative. I would also like to point out the advantages that we have as a country for this particular initiative. Point one is the Jam Trinity, which is the Jandhan, Aadhaar and Mobile Trinity. So we have Jandhan accounts, we have an Aadhaar card, which is a social, which is akin to a social security number. And we have mobile penetration in India almost to the extent of 53%, which is 2020 data. Patient records are the property of the patients. The control over the patient records is that of the patient himself or herself. In countries like US, you will not see that. So here the record is completely under the control of the patient, which really helps a digital mission. Mobile penetration, as I mentioned earlier, the ecosystem, the tech and the human capital, and not to mention the tremendous support of the government, which is uh, going uh, out full speed, thinking big, starting small and scaling fast to make this a reality. Next, please. Now, this is what we are going to see shortly, hopefully. If you see on the left-hand side, you have an ABHA, you have H HFR, and you have HPR. Now, what is this? ABHA is nothing but a Ayushman Bharat health account, which will be the health ID of a patient. HFR would be a health facility registry. So each hospital, diagnostic center, pharmacy would have a particular registration number. Then what below that is the HPR, which is the health professional registry the doctors, whether allopathic doctors or Ayush doctors, nurses, allied health professionals would all have a health professional registry. This would be linked digitally to the patient uh, longitudinal health record. So today what happens is suppose a patient is in say North India and then moves to South India. Some of his records are left behind in the North, some of them, and then he develop, gets new records in the South. They, he has to physically carry them. The hospital may or may not share. The hospital may or may not have EMRs. So <clears throat> once we achieve our dream of the Ayushman Bharat digital mission, we are going. To, the patient is going to have access to his or her health records longitudinally. Now here, you are able to see the demographic details. It's a 50-year-old male. This is the ABHA ID. Patient has... Um, say a diabetes mellitus and <clears throat> the record of the HbA1c had malaria, was given chloroquine, went to a government hospital, was given azithromycin for upper respiratory infection, went to another private hospital, was given a cephalosporin and, and you know, omase has taken two doses of COVID, or COVID vaccine. So this is something which will be available to the patient at the click of a button and it will be the patient's prerogative to share it with a healthcare provider or a doctor for a particular duration of time. Next, please. Now, this is something uh, which we look forward to. So the systems, which is the digital systems, have access to the patient details. And hence, we can look at the data of the country. So when systems have access to large-scale patient data, which when aggregated, anonymized, and analyzed, can be used to identify healthcare trends, patterns, and insights, thereby inform policy and help improve service delivery. Next, please. Healthy citizens are the greatest asset any nation can have. With that, I conclude. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sumana, for your presentation. Uh, it is a great presentation indeed. 
Uh, but, uh, you know, how, hopefully we can able to share your slides, especially the videos later on so that we can able to go through with it. Uh, correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, Dr. Sumana. Uh, the artificial intelligence and the digital health uh, were made for each other. And the digital um, uh, health looks like uh, the digital solutions to promote the health of the body uh, in the mind. And also the artificial intelligence attempts to reproduce or fits of the mind in digital form. This means that uh, the digital health is the matter and AI is the mind. Is it, Dr. Savannah? Well, yes and no both. Um, huh? Digital health can be as simple as just electronic medical records. Now, mm -hmm. it's, you know, one step after the other. So we went digital first in the sense we had an electronic hospital, mm -hmm. we had electronic records, and we have, say, fundus images for the retina. Now, what do you do with this? And then the, the concept of AI started trickling in, that if you have, say, X thousand images of the retina, can we train a machine to pick it up, to pick up basics in the fundus? which otherwise we'll have to put a human resource to sit and kind of study it. And so we started training machines using machine learning. So mm -hmm. obviously, you know, it's like steam engines came and then uh, you had petrol vehicles and now you have electronic vehicles, electric vehicles, sorry. So it is related, but it's not exactly um, one leading to the other, I would say. All right, thank you so much for clarification, Doctor. Uh, there are some areas, uh, I'm very much interested about your uh, presentation, Doctor. There are some areas in AI uh, technologies outperform medical specialists. Uh, you are, uh, both of us are doctors and, you know, in anomaly detection and this is a uh, prediction, uh, there are reports that artificial intelligence is uh, better than the medical experts at spotting lung tumors. Uh, and also AI can do 24-7 monitoring. So these are some of the few innovations uh, now transforming medicine at a very remarkable pace. So before we will end the session, I have a $1 million question for you, Dr. Zumana. Uh, when will robots uh, replace doctors? Or shall I say, um, artificial, in, uh, artificial intelligence can replace doctors? Is this, uh, is this possible? What do you think, Dr. Zumana? I surely opinion? hope not. I surely <laughs> hope not. Um, so, of course, there are advantages uh, of artificial intelligence. They can crunch billions of data sets in seconds. That's one mm. thing. They don't have egos. They don't need to sleep. They don't need a break. They um, don't have biases. However, I mean, if we could uh, convert a human being into two plus two is four, and as doctors, we know that may or may not be true in medicine because there's a lot of gray in medicine. And hence, um, that delta is something I hope machines, uh, I mean, I, I feel machines will never be able to fulfill and I hope they don't. Otherwise, we'll have a Skynet kind of a situation. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Savannah, for your thoughts. Well, I agree with you uh, that robots cannot replace doctors. Definitely, uh, robots cannot show empathy. And empathy is one of the key elements of quality healthcare. Uh, it uh, improves patient satisfaction and uh, promotes selling. And unfortunately, uh, empathy is unachievable for an automated machine. And uh, that's the main argument against autonomous AI in the healthcare. Um, we might teach robots, you know, to mimic these things. I mean, uh, to become. Uh, you know, the way the handshake of the patients. But, you know, the sincerity cannot be thought in, in, in robots. That's the first thing. And um, that is the reason why our medical students, uh, the future doctors, should not only equip them with an excellent knowledge and competent skills, but you need to inculcate or instill their affective domain to the fullest uh, which is one of the essential areas in the assessment of learning outcomes of medical students. And um, I think that is the reason why our university or maybe 
uh, in other universities also. Uh, the Management and Science University, where I am currently now, is started to assess and include the effective level of domains in their academic performance or grades. So in the future, they will become more holistic and more compassionate doctors. So artificial intelligence, I agree with Dr. Osumana, artificial intelligence is not a silver bullet. However, I believe that uh, artificial intelligence and doctors can complement each other. And AI can actually add value to the patient quality care. And that is innovation. And uh, yeah, so if there are some questions, I would like to read there are some questions in the chat box. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Suwana. All right, there are some uh, questions here. Yeah. Uh, I think this is for Dr. Joy. Uh, Dr. Joy, could you please elaborate some more on what actually is regenerative medicine? <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, doctor. Okay. So regenerative medicine, it is like, you know, when you talk about your, uh, what do you call, uh, stem cell therapy and some sorts of treatment, which helps some tissues, some organs to grow once again, that comes under that purview. Okay. All right. Uh, Prem Kumar Nayupai. Are you satisfied with the, with the answers? I hope you are. Okay, there's another one, Dr. Uh, uh, Joy. How rural areas would be integrated with this health technology? See, uh, what we have experienced when you say rural India, there are mm -hmm. places where you have a good, good, maybe 3G connectivity, and we have tried and tested connectivity, transferring images, transferring data from there to our main hospital. But at the same time, there are rural areas where you can't even think of getting a basic mobile signal, forget about 3G, 4G. So what we can't do there in terms of transferring things. So what we have done as a decision that when these mobile units and all they are back it, i'm giving example in our circumstances when they are back to an area then all those data are transferred and the uh, you know advices are taken from the experts and if you ask in general how they can be integrated probably you have to have a how and spoke model and as per that the rural area which are not very easily reachable there are government support in terms of getting satellite-based connectivity. Through that, you can transfer. But if it is not available, probably you have to reach a place. You can get a signal and you can transfer data and things like that. All right. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Joy. Are there any questions from the board, from the audience? So Dr. Roy, if I could add to that answer. Yes, uh, Dr. Sumana. So under the National Digital Health Mission, we are also coming out with an offline module for exactly the areas that Mr. Joy mentioned. Uh, and we have uh, frontline workers on the ground called um, ANMs and ASHA workers. So we'll use their help, come out with an offline module and attempt to cover these areas. All right, that's very good. So that, that's the way to bridge the, the digital divide. divide and uh -huh. the, the earlier question of yours was All the right. divide. Okay, thank you so much. All right, so I need to wrap up. We're running out of time. You know, we just need, I just need to wrap up of the, the topics that we have covered in hospital management. It is a very good uh, presentation to our panelists. And I would like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Vivek uh, for uh, presenting the engineering design innovations for hospital buildings. He emphasized well on the flexibility of the hospital buildings, which is very, very important on nowadays, especially at this pandemic time. And also Dr. Chakraborty um, regarding about regarding innovations in healthcare through technology. So um, he discussed about the, he introduced to us the fourth uh, industrial revol uh, revolution 
It is the birth of artificial intelligence. And also, uh, Dr. So Dr. Richard, uh, Dr. Richard uh, discussed about the technological enhancements in hospital management due to a uh, pandemic and um, yeah, a, a, a very good presentations, uh, especially uh, with regards to the, the role of technology in, in the healthcare. And lastly, uh, Dr. Sumana mentioned about the innovations on hospital management, uh, the digital health and uh, artificial intelligence, which I totally agree that robots cannot replace doctors. Eh? So I think uh, we should uh, we should not only focus not only on the technological innovations, uh, but I think we should also dwell on social innovations or to transform healthcare delivery. Uh, you know, when uh, we have discussed about technological innovation a while ago, and we can see that uh, there can be a possibility of digital divide. But when we say uh, social innovation, we try to dwell on social innovation to transform our uh, healthcare delivery. Actually, we can able to address here the digital divide uh, because uh, the social innovation tackles uh, how to improve health. Uh, by engaging the communities in creating and also sustaining solutions. And through participatory approaches, uh, some novel solutions that we can design and implement it uh, by uh, scientists, by innovators, by the uh, health system actors and other actors uh, to address uh, you know, complex and long-standing health problems. And I strongly believe that this social innovation can really accelerate the progress towards the universal health coverage and also our sustainable developmental goals. And uh, through these social innovations, we can bridge the gap in health system and access to health services, uh, especially in uh, low and also in middle income. Um, also, there is a greatest challenge in artificial intelligence and these uh, healthcare domains. Um, it is not whether the technologies will be capable enough to be useful, but rather we need to ensure that their adoption in their daily clinical practice. And, um, AI system must be approved by regulators. That is very, very important because nowadays there's so many uh, apps coming in and there's so many uh, healthcare system, uh, uh, integrated systems, but it is not, most of them are not really regulated. Uh, there's, I hope that there's some regulatory bodies who can really focus into that because as I mentioned to uh, Dr. Rich a while ago, how about, you know, this, uh, um, security of the data, you know, big data, how are we going to ensure that? So uh, there should be some regulatory bodies, there should be a very good policies, how are we going to implement on this? Right? And um, I, I, I believe that, you know, uh, we expect uh, there is some uh, limited use of AI in clinical practice within five years, but uh, I think more extensive use within 10 years. And it also seems increasingly clear that uh, the, the AI system um, definitely will not replace human clinicians. And uh, I hope that uh, building also public, uh, public trust through strong communication strategies across all the digital channels and also demonstrating and commitment to uh, proportionate privacy are very much imperative. So uh, I think we don't have much time for the queue or you know, some other questions, but uh, maybe if you have some more questions, you can drop your questions in the chat box and to our panelists and they will try to answer your questions. So I call Dr. Prashant Sharma, the Associate Professor of IIHMR University for the vote of thanks. So I believe this is a very productive session and thank you so much and stay safe everyone. Well, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Roy. Yes, somebody is saying yes, a uh, formal vote of thanks. And uh, I'm, I'm extremely excited to propose formal vote of thanks on behalf of the organizing committee of IHMR University, Jaipur. And we are extremely thankful for such wonderful deliberation that has happened in this session. I must say that it was almost like a roller coaster ride where uh, every speaker was giving so much of uh, uh, new ideas 
so much of knowledge and so much of skills uh, which is certainly going to help our student and the the people who are working in hospital management at large uh, to th to think about all these to think about how technology can enable and how technology can become Professor Prasant, your voice is cracking. Uh, maybe you can switch off the video and provide some bandwidth. Key initiative in the future. So, uh, on behalf of the organizing couple, to Dr. Vivek Desai, uh, uh, Dr. Joy, maybe. Uh, hope I'm audible now. Yes, perfect. Great. So, uh, so on behalf of the organizing committee of uh, Spadarnia 2022, uh, I would like to propose formal vote of thanks and. Uh, we are extremely thankful to Dr. Vivek Desai, uh, uh, Mr. Joy Chakravarti, Ms. Richa Singh Dev Gupta, Dr. Sumana for their wonderful deliberations on different different topics which were assigned to them. And the summary has some uh, summarization has already been uh, done by the session chair, Dr. Roy. And we are also extremely thankful to Dr. Roy for uh, inviting all the speakers, giving them equal space, and uh, 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 inculcating a lot of discussion, inviting them for a variety of ideas, and uh, beautifully and wonderfully uh, chairing this session. So thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for being part of this. We are also thankful to the, uh, the participants who have joined uh, from different countries, uh, uh, from different disciplines, and we are also thankful for the organizers who have actually organized. Over to Palak. Palak. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Palak. Yes, sir. So I would request all uh, chair and all the speakers present out today for uh, to switch on their camera so we can have a group photograph of this event. Palak, you just want the panelists for this session, right? Yes, sir. The chair and the speakers of uh, track two, sir. Thank you so much. Now soon we will start in the track three, sir. 